Australian waterways. Our lakes, wetlands, rivers and streams are considered some of the most diverse and purest ecosystems in the world. Australia is also one of the world's driest continents and relies heavily on waterways for a range of environmental, economic and social uses. The demand for increased water resources for agriculture and irrigation, for recreation such as fishing, swimming and tourism, and for human consumption has upset the environmental balance of many of our waterways. Ensuring adequate water supplies is vital for governments, farmers and the community. This has resulted in the regulation and damming of many of our rivers, especially those in the Murray-Darling Basin. The regulation of these rivers has changed their natural flow, making it more predictable, which, in turn, has altered the river environment. Major modification of our waterways has had a significant effect on the health and ecology of our rivers. River regulation has led to changes in ecological processes and created an environment well suited to the survival of the common carp, growing populations of which are a visible symptom of human-induced changes in our waterways. The common carp was first introduced to Australia in the 1860s, but only spread significantly when carp escaped from a fish farm at Bulara in Victoria during flooding in the late 1960s and spread into the Murray-Darling Basin. Other isolated populations of carp existed around Sydney before they infiltrated the Murray-Darling Basin. Carp originated in Central Asia and are now widely distributed around the world. It surprises many Australians to learn that carp are the most eaten fish in the world, mainly in Asia. China's total aquaculture production is dominated by carp raised in relatively low-tech inland ponds for local consumption. The four major carp species, silver carp, grass carp, common carp and big head carp account for more than one third of world aquaculture production, nearly all of it in China. The consequences of introducing carp into Australia were never thought through at the time and now, like other pest species such as the rabbit and fox, the carp has made its presence felt. Carp possess many of the attributes that typify a successful invasive species. They are very hardy, surviving a wide range of water temperature from as low as 4 degrees up to 35 degrees Celsius. They can tolerate low dissolved oxygen levels and can gulp air from the surface of the water when dissolved oxygen levels are depleted. Furthermore, they are highly fertile. An adult female carp, weighing 6 kilograms, can produce 1.6 million eggs, equating to about 13% of its body weight. Carp are also relatively unaffected by high concentrations of pollutants and sediment in the water. Female carp mature at about 2 to 4 years of age and are capable of multiple spawning all year round, if water temperatures remain above 16 degrees Celsius, as is the case in some Queensland rivers. Further south in New South Wales and Victoria, spawning time is generally from October to February, when water temperatures are warmer. Following spawning, eggs are attached to submerged plants and vegetation, which then hatch into larvae. These larvae are often flushed out of the wetlands and sheltered backwaters into the river where they're washed downstream in flooding events. I guess from the broader perspective, you know, carp have been known to comp uh, comprise 96% of the fish biomass in some rivers in the basin. Um, when you've got a species that's so fecund that can you know, produce two million eggs per female per breeding event, and you've got that many fish, then uh, just intuitively they have to have a pretty big impact on the amount of resources available to native fish. I guess over the years people have blamed carp for just about everything from blue-green algae to the disappearance of native fish. 
The fact is that carp definitely do environmental damage. The, because of their feeding technique, the way they suck bottom sediment up and then spurt it out and look for organisms within that sediment, that causes a higher degree of turbidity in the water, reduces the amount of light that can penetrate, that reduces weed growth and has all sorts of detrimental effects. They also uh, undermine banks and cause uh, erosion and collapse and so forth. They're uh, a transmitter of diseases and parasites. But look, when you get right down to it, carp are as much a symptom of unhealthy waterways as they are a cause of them. Carp also contribute to the silting up of water in irrigation and drainage channels for agriculture. This can cause excessive wear to pumps and machinery and prevent the establishment of aquatic vegetation for stability of channel banks. Most Australians dislike carp because they're not considered good eating and are prolific compared to preferred native fish species. There's a strong concern among Australian public for the health of native fish. The unfortunate thing in Australia is that Australians in general are not fish eaters we're more red meat eaters and whereas in Europe fish was the basis of most of their their meals for for years and years. Despite their reputation carp do have commercial uses. K and C Fisheries based in Gippsland Victoria harvests carp from Australian waters to process it for export food products, liquid fertilizer, crayfish bait and pet food. These products supply markets in Asia, Europe and Australia. KNC Fisheries dominate 90% of the Australian commercial carp market, making consulting with the industry an integral part of managing carp in Australia. Overseas, carp is a, a major protein source and it's quite a common fish eaten in most countries. But they're a, a, an, an animal that's not meant to be in this environment, they're not an Australian, they're not a native fish and I don't stick up for them in the sense of saying that they don't do damage because they do do a lot of damage to the environment. The question of how to control carp has challenged governments, scientists and the community since the early 1990s. Some ideas have been around for many years, some are very new and still being investigated. Many of these ideas have been nurtured by the Murray-Darling Basin Commission and the National Carp Task Force through a community government partnership. One method is targeted fishing campaigns, including community fishing competitions. However, to be successful, fishing has to be continuous and specific only for carp to protect native fish. Other fishing techniques have also been used, including gill nets and traps but these pose a risk to native fish and fauna. Some communities have successfully screened wetlands to keep carp out, demonstrating the positive environmental improvements that occur once carp are controlled. Fishways in the Murray-Darling Basin provide opportunities to target the removal of pest fish such as carp and provide passage for native fish for spawning migration and movement. The other particular technique that we'll be trialling in the new fishways um, is a, is a uh, carp separation cage and that's built around the, the observation that carp tend to jump over small barriers. So if you, can cr if you build a cage, which we have done, which has two exit ways, uh, the um, native fish will go one way and carp will, will go the other. So this is part of a, a package that we're uh, dealing with now, $25 million program building fishways from the sea right up to Hume Dam, so it's about two and a half thousand kilometres of continuous sort of fishways for, uh, for native fish. Poisons such as rotenone have been used to eradicate carp and other pest fish from some enclosed waters. These methods are risky as they are expensive, broad spectrum, dilute rapidly and require sustained high dosages to kill some pest fish species such as carp. The Pest Animal Control Cooperative Research Centre is investigating alternatives to poisons to complement other short, medium term solutions for carp control. With ongoing support from the Murray-Darling Basin Commission through the 50-year Native Fish Strategy, the Pest Animal Control Cooperative Research Centre has been managing the Daughterless Carp Program since January 2003. 
Oh, the the um, public interest in the Daughterless Carp program has been absolutely incredible. Um, people have wanted to know more about it and have been really passionate about us doing something more about carp. Now you won't get very much done unless you commit to longer term projects where people can see uh, a pathway through to making a difference and that's where this Murray-Darling Basin Commission uh, project is so important. It's part of a 50 year strategy uh, under the native fish strategy to try and get some some changes in our rivers. Biological control can potentially provide a long-term sustainable strategy to manage carp in Australian waterways. We don't have to look hard to find examples of how biological control has been successfully applied to the Australian landscape for pest animal control. Myxomavirus, also known as myxomatosis, still kills 50% of rabbits born in Australia every year and, more recently, calicivirus has been successful in managing rabbit populations in some parts of Australia. These self-sustaining biological control agents bring millions of dollars of benefit to farmers and the Australian environment. Leading the scientific development of daughterless carp technology is Dr Ron Thresher of CSIRO Marine Research in Hobart. At the moment we've got a team of about eight scientists working on this down here in Hobart. I'm leading the team. The team consists of five or six geneticists, uh, specialist aquarists, keeping our animals happy, healthy and everything. We've also got several fish population modelers and geneticists, genetics modelers working on it to try and improve our models and come up with better predictors. And we have a specialist risk assessor who's working with us as well, trying to make sure that we're covering all of the bases in terms of what are the underlying risk of this stuff. In normal carp development, embryos hatch into larvae. Within these embryos, a protein called aromatase, shown by the red squares, converts testosterone, the green triangles, into oestrogens. Oestrogens lead to the development of female carp when present in high enough quantities. Male fish result when testosterone is the dominant hormone. A similar pathway occurs for daughterless development. The difference is that no functional aromatase protein is produced, so testosterone is not converted to oestrogens, and fish become exclusively male. So, how do we block the production of aromatase? This is DNA within the daughterless carrier. In unmodified carp, the gene that codes for the aromatase protein is present in a particular orientation, shown by the red arrow. In daughterless carp, a synthetic section of DNA, containing two mirror images of the aromatase gene sequence, shown by the red arrows, is inserted into the carp genome. When transcribed, this modified DNA produces an RNA strand that folds over itself to align the mirrored sequences. The double-stranded RNA is recognised as abnormal in the cell, and the normal cell processes cut it up into small pieces, rendering it useless. No functional aromatase protein is produced. In comparison, normal carp development produces single-stranded RNA, which leads to production of the aromatase protein needed for female development. First, the construct itself is, is going to be nothing but carp genes. We're not going to be sticking any funny tomato genes in. It's not going to glow red in the dark or anything. We're just taking a carp existing gene, switching it around a little bit, and then putting it back into carp again. So we've got small populations of target species, basically model species, we're using in the laboratory now. <clears throat> and basically we're using a, a fish called Madaka, which is a small aquarium fish. It's closely related to carp. So what we're learning in it, we can also apply to carp. So it's not a transgenic fish as anybody would define the thing. We're using genetic technologies to produce it, but it's still basically a carp. It's, just, it's in fact a, the kind of thing that could happen naturally 
Uh, these sort of rearrangements happen all the time in wild populations. We're just doing it artificially and forcing it back into the population relatively quickly. Understandably, some people are nervous about genetically modified products these days. A fear of the unknown has arisen from the rapid advances in biotechnology, which has allowed scientists to do things that are deemed unnatural in some people's eyes. Much of the concern surrounds genetically modified food crops, such as canola and other food products. However, people have tended to adopt different attitudes to using genetic techniques, where it can be used to benefit human health, control pests, or improve the environment. That doesn't worry you that nah. we're using a genetic nah, technique? To not really. Anything to get rid of them. If we can get rid of those bloody things, get rid of them. Right? I just wanted to talk to you this afternoon about uh, fish stocks in the Murray-Darling River. We've got a Community consultation and education is a critical step in implementing daughterless technology. It's important that an understanding of the drivers behind people's concerns towards genetically modified organisms are addressed so people can make informed decisions. Carp are a major pest and it's clear we'll need a host of control tools if we're ever going to reduce the damaging impacts of carp in Australia's waterways. While daughterless technology offers hope as a long-term control tool for carp, it will be important to develop and continue to implement short-term controls as well. This is a priority for both the Murray-Darling Basin Commission and the Pest Animal Control Cooperative Research Centre. It's, it's world-leading science, it's Australian science, it's right at the top of uh, the tree in terms of leading-edge scientific work. But again, we don't want to just promote it as a silver bullet. You want to work it in with other leading approaches, plus base level management like trapping and, and removal of the car. Um, you've got to make it work by knocking down the numbers uh, initially and then putting in your, your daughterless animals. Due to their environmental tolerance, we can expect carp numbers to increase and further their range in Australia if we elect to do nothing. Such an example lies in Tasmania, where carp were introduced by careless fishermen into two blue ribbon trout fisheries, Lakes Crescent and Sorrel. Since 1996, the Inland Fisheries Service in Tasmania has been combating the spread of carp in these lakes and preventing their spread into other Tasmanian waterways. Controlling carp will bring benefits to the entire community, whether they be irrigators, farmers, tourists, environmentalists, anglers, rural or urban communities. Fishermen will have a better chance of catching their preferred native species, cleaner water will result in safer swimming, and boating and a healthier ecosystem will be enjoyed by everyone. It's one of those extraordinary efforts where environmentalists and those that use the rivers um, irrigators, everyone agrees that we want less carp in the river and we want to do it in a sustainable fashion. The future of successful carp management will depend on continuing cooperation between researchers, the community and government through a partnership approach. It won't be easy and will not be solved overnight. Only one thing is certain, doing nothing is not an option.